All right, this week's format of the blog post is a little different. Okay, I wanted to get your perspective on the topic I was kind of breaking down these past couple weeks. Um, everybody has a different way of looking at things, uh, but in season training, uh, we have a lot of different ideas out there. You know, let's just maintain, let's fight fatigue, let's, we can get better strength, we can get better speed, we can get better power. A lot of population of total performance, primarily baseball guys, and specifically this time of the year, those guys are getting ready to go off into their season. Um, what kind of training would you recommend for high school athletes, middle school high school athletes about to go throw? So, one of the things that we have to look at, and I think it's probably one of the most important variables, is consistency. And so, as soon as the high school athlete starts season, they're going to be practicing about five days a week. Okay, bare minimum, five, five days a week. Then, on top of the fact that they're already waking up going through a full school day, are they eating enough? Are they drinking enough? And all those will play into a factor where will they come in? I would say, and I would bet that most baseball practices end around five or six o'clock. So then where does that lead time for training? And I think that realistically, the high school athlete, not going any, not going younger or older to collegiate, just the high school in our population, probably once or twice a week would be plenty to be able to maintain and manage certain strength and power levels. But consistency is our number one variable that we're kind of looking at and then we kind of have to base it on. I agree. I think at this at this stage of development, we're not dealing with guys that are finished products. We're not dealing with you know ten year MLB vets, you know NFL guys, whatever it may be. We're dealing with a high school kid that hasn't been training for anything more than three or four years at the very top end, yeah. and for the majority, it's been a year or two plus. Uh, they're still on the developmental side. They still need to progress. So any idea that guys need to take a season off from training or save for the save uh, save their arms for practice or whatever we have to mitigate our volume and we don't want to make sure that they're we want to make sure that they're not gassed going into the next day but they need to be able to maintain like you said stay consistent with their training regimen over the course of the season or else they're going to take a step back and have to work that much harder to get that back um, next thing i want to talk about we know the importance of it and you just kind of said one or two times a week so within those training days within those sessions what kind of exercises are you doing with these guys to make sure that one, we're getting results, we're maintaining strength, possibly improving, and number two, not overworking the kids to where they're gonna be sore the next day or they're gonna get negatively affected by soreness for the practice? So when it comes to effects, so now I wanna go back to kind of residual training effects. So residual training effects, if you look at strength, you look at hypertrophy strength and power. If you look at the power, those residual effects, so let's say you do something explosive one day, how long is how long do those effects last? They last about seven days at the max. So right. you need to constantly kind of stimulate the central nervous system to keep it, kind of keep that burst, keep that pop within the athlete. Strength and hypertrophy levels can last anywhere between 18 and 30 days. Strength lasts 30, I believe hypertrophy is, is around 18 to 24 days and you're gonna keep those residual training effects. So now we look at, okay, so if you want to take the season off, well, if you look, just looking at that fact right there, you're gonna lose most of that in, within a month you're not going to lose everything, but you are going to decline instead of at least maintain. From the previous experiences, a lot of people go with the speed side of things. I think we need to do both because even though it says that speed will keep and maintain strength, I just, I, in athletes, granted this, this was a college level, I just haven't seen the speed be able to maintain the strength levels and they, they will definitely get weaker, which will kind of like decrease tissue qualities. So there's two ends. You can either go on the high end with super low volume, your, your reps of like one to two, maximum three, with your compound movements. Even then, you need to go even further and take out the eccentric component to it. So doing like a deadlift, a clean pull, just dropping it. Okay, just to be able to at least get some sort of pop, but not taking out the eccentric contraction, which usually creates soreness in our athletes. Right. So kind of trying to keep their burst. With our high school athletes, it's would I would recommend something being super simple. They've done before without loading the spine, something like a hip thrust, which is super easy. You can load it up, you don't put any load on their spine, and it's easy and simple for them to remember. I would do a back squat, but I would probably err towards the side of caution, maybe going on the speed side of things and not loading up heavy because we're still young, so we're still getting that training stimulus. Yes, but we have to just be careful with what they're doing and like the training needs that they're at. But it's really, it, it depends on the answer, it kind of goes back to the residual. Right, and you told me a, a good piece of advice a couple weeks ago um, when I was asking you about this. You know, um, keep it the same. 
any type, and you couldn't be more right, any type of differences in the training as far as movements go, when the body has to learn something that it's not accustomed to, it takes that much more effort, it takes that much more thought, and you can induce you know, soreness just from introducing a different movement, whether it's you know, a squat to a front squat or a front squat to a deadlift, whatever, whatever you decide to go with, like stick with it. Make changes in the volume, make changes in the intensity, you know, work the muscle groups that are needed around it, but end of the day, we've got to make sure these kids aren't coming in tired and leaving even more tired. Yeah. True. Okay. That, that's another thing you brought up too, is this the exercise, exercise variations. Right. Like you said, if, if you're going to go with a, a squat, or you're going to go with a squat variation, go with a squat, go with a front squat, and go with a different type of squat, but keep the variations super minimal, maybe do pin presses, right. or you're doing like, you're doing squats from like a quarter squat. But the variation will also, like you said, induce, but the, the exercise selection needs to say almost damn near same throughout the entire end season just to mitigate those, like, the, it mitigates muscle soreness. Because the most important thing that they're gonna do, the volume that they're gonna get, is from the practice. And we can't control what maybe their sporting coach might do to them. Like, their sporting coach is angry one day because they had a bad practice, and now they do 16, 100, 110 yard sprints for a baseball player or for even for a football player, or they're running poles because they had a bad practice. So we, they'll come in shot, which means our training needs to completely change. So the only thing we, we can actually manage is volume. Right. And the number, one, the number one thing in season that our athletes or any athletes do is that they compete. So we need to make sure that they feel fresh, they feel good leaving, they're maintaining and managing those strength levels and those power levels, and they're using all that hard work that they just did in the off season, and they keep it throughout the season. So when they're done, they're not starting from five steps back, they'll maybe start a step back and then be right on top where they were when they left off before season started. Exactly, exactly. I couldn't have said that better and I 100% agree. Um, so the hard part for us being in the private sector is that we can't control anything that's going to happen outside of these doors. They have their school schedule, they have their sports schedule, they have whatever other activities they're doing. We can't control their sleep, their diet. So we have to make sure that we're tracking their readiness every time they walk in the door. Whether it's a grip dynamometer, whether it's a self-reported scale, whether it's a jump test, whatever it may be, however we decide to roll with it, um, that's going to tell us what kind of training needs to take on that day. Because the last thing we want is to create a negative effect or, or, or over fatigue an athlete, have them go to the school, and then we're well, the top. You know, it could be any number of places, but the first place they're going to look is the private coaches. So um, next week, I want to dive deeper into in-season training. Uh, maybe going to the tempos, uh, our exercise selection of what we're moving forward as our baseball guys head off in the season. And uh, maybe if anybody has any questions you want to hit us up, let us know and we'll answer those for you. Thank you, Mr. Delpound. Del you got it.